know you're gonna dig this. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Ryan McGlynn and welcome to Funk Chronicles. I'm standing in for Dr. Turk Logan. Today is going to be very exciting. It's very exciting, for, especially for those who are into the funk. Um, and you know that there was rock and roll, and there's also called the funk. And the funk is really funky. And this is going to be a funky interview, because I'm going to be talking to Tommy Jenkins from Cameo. And Cameo goes back into 1970. And today we're going to be doing something exciting where, that we could never have thought of in 1970. We're going to be Skyping. And so I just want to let you know that as we talk about uh, Cameo and and, and they had one of their hits was Rigor Mortis, which would be very near and dear to me as a former mortician. But um, <laughs> let, let me uh, introduce you uh, to Tommy Jenkins. Welcome, Tommy. Hello, Ryan, and everybody out there in <laughs> Skype land. How y'all doing? <laughs> you know, this is just so, 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 I'm what you call a primitive modern woman, and so when, we talk, when we're talking about doing Skype interviews, that is way out of my uh, comfort zone. So, hey. uh, welcome to Funk Chronicles, and thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to be a part of this uh, mom momentous uh, uh, movement oh. that we have going. Uh, I oh, know that pleasure. you met uh, David Webb, and uh, you, tell me about that meeting. He's the president and CEO of the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center. Tell us about that meeting. Well, David uh, is doing a fantastic thing. Him and his group are uh, doing something that is, has long, is long overdue. Okay, the funk has uh, influenced and uh, been a part of the landscape of music since the 60s and uh, David has finally taken it upon himself to to recognize the fact that a lot of artists uh, of today's uh, music and of doing things of today have been influenced and still in, are influenced by the music that came before as far as funk is concerned uh, started with James Brown and and before that, and then George and uh, George Clinton, and of course uh, Cameo and, and and a bunch of other guys who are our peers, uh, have uh, have set the groundwork. And I think it's a great thing that David is doing. He's a fantastic individual, and as and as well as everyone on his team that are uh, that are putting this thing together, man. You know, and and all of my peers, everybody that I know that I've came, come up with in the, in the game are supporting it, I'm behind it, and it's just a beautiful thing. Well, tell me, tell me, Tommy, uh, now that I have you, give me some history of Cameo. Uh, when did you originate? Where did you come from? Especially, how did you get the name Cameo? I always talk about Cameo appearances. So I want to know yeah, about well, how, how did you get to Cameo? Well, that's interesting. Uh, we started in New York City. I'm from New Jersey, actually. It's a town called Rawway, which is a, about 10 miles from New York. So it's right on the outside of the outs outskirts of the city. And uh, we started in New York. Larry uh, Blackman is from Harlem. And uh, in the beginning, I was uh, mid-70s, right out of high school. I was uh, dating a girl who was uh, in a band at the time, and uh, we were in Queens, and we're playing in Queens, and Larry, <coughs> excuse me, our, our manager, who became our manager, was there managing that band, and we got to talking, and he said, hey, uh, what do you do? I said, I'm a singer, blah, 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 and he said, well, okay, well, I know a guy who's starting another band, and uh, I'd like you to meet him. So the next day, it was Memorial Day, I'll never forget it, Larry came to the uh, to the uh, the venue, the club where we were, had big uh, 
<laughs> big uh, uh, hat, and, you know, very New York, very uh, musician artistry, artisty, and uh, uh, and that was from there. That's how we started. We started as a New York City players. That's how we began, and doing shows up and down the, the East Coast, clubs in New York, doing to Canada, going everywhere, Michigan, just taking our cars, vans, you know, doing the the putting the work in basically you know and a lot of stuff a lot that doesn't go on today of course because the times have definitely changed but at the same time we got a lot of experience performing and just doing shows I would actually I was still in high school and I would go to school and on the weekends I would go out on the road and then come back and go to school uh, that week and then when I stopped I graduated I would go to work and I'd work and go on the weekends and and and, and tour with the band and uh, and then I'd go back to work on Monday 7 a.m. So, so it was so like how, that how long did you all stay I mean you know when you think about 13 people 13 people in a band or that's a lot of people and yeah that was a lot but we didn't start like that we started with about seven guys everybody was basically from New York so uh, one day, you asked about how we got the name, we were in Canada, and as we, of course, were the New York City Players, we had gotten uh, an opportunity to record a single. Uh, there was a guy in New York City who was a, a, a Broadway songwriter, and he came up with a disco song, because of course disco is very popular in the 70s, and we recorded the song and it got to uh, Neil Bogart who was the president of uh, Casablanca Records at the time he loved the song because of course Donna Summers was on the label Kiss and a bunch of other people but he loved the song and signed us uh, to the label and, uh, and we were on a disco song and that's how we we uh, got the recording contract now at the time we wanted to change our name because to the players but we couldn't do it because Ohio players were real big at the time. So we were in Canada and there was a, a, a billboard that said Cameo on it. And it was basically just advertising cigarettes or whatever. And we said, Cameo, that's, that's a cool name. And then, you know, at the time we didn't want to be associated with cigarettes or alcohol or anything like that. But uh, we said, okay, well, cameo means cameo appearance. We wanted everybody, the, the theme of the band, for everyone to have their own identity, to be able to step out on their own and, and, and make that cameo appearance. And also the cameo uh, brooch, you know, the piece of jewelry, you know, fine, uh, craft, finely crafted jewel or piece of jewelry. So we looked at it like that, and we had a bunch of metaphors for what cameo meant. It was a short name very pleasant and pleasing but at the same time it was almost like a a juxtaposition between the kind of music we did and the name you know the name is a little soft but at the, but our music was hard and crazy so we kind of dug that uh, that that is such an interesting story so tell me what 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 is cameo doing now where where are you what are you doing uh how many well, other members touring. are still together, or are you getting together? Or I just oh yeah, like, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Tell uh, me about we it. had like like you mentioned earlier, we had 13 members, or maybe 15, 16 members at one time. At one time during the days when we had horns, and you know the cameosis days, and the uh, a lot of the uh, we, we split down, uh, cut it down to five, and did the three. But you know things happen, and and the guys were still friends with everyone. So you know people just go on and do what they do, and, and it's all good. But um, we're still touring. As a matter of fact, I leave for uh, Indianapolis, uh, and uh, I got a three-day weekend in Indianapolis, New Orleans, and uh, Kansas City this weekend. And uh, it's a possibility of us uh, doing a Vegas uh, run at the Westgate Hotel uh, for about starting in October for about three months. <clears throat> so that's uh, an interesting kind of situation for us. You know, I would never think I'd be in Vegas. I always thought that's where groups went to die, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a different kind of, it's a different kind of thing in Vegas now, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's the capital. It's always been the uh, entertainment capital of the world, but <clears throat> it's a long way from, uh, from, uh, from Harlem uh, to, uh, to Vegas. Well, tell me, how many, how many original members are still in the group? 
Well, actually, we've got guys in the group that have been with us for 30 years. So uh, uh, when, we, when you say original member, Larry and I are the only original, original members that are still here. Uh, him and I started the group together uh, along with Gregory Johnson and because uh, Greg was already with him. He played keyboards. He was a funk funk character with the top hat uh, you may see in the videos and stuff. And uh, and actually he was the funk funk guy back then with the rigor mortis and the whole thing. And you mentioned uh, our first album, Cardiac Arrest. But um, yeah, we've got Larry and I the first uh, are the, uh, the only original members from that time. But we got guys from the 80s, man, you know, Charlie and Aaron and Anthony, uh, Jeff Nelson, Kevin Kendricks, you know, we've all been, we've all been together over 25, 30 years. So we we call us we call them lifers, you know, and they this it's a blessing to be able to still have guys with all the craziness going on with our funk brothers and with the groups, you know, splitting up and doing this and doing that. You know, we're we're still together doing our thing, man. And and you know what that that is what what you said there is really a, a historic statement because so so many of you started out when you were so young and didn't have any idea of w what the future was. You were just living in the present, and right. to take 25, 30 years down the road that you have matured, you've learned through life experiences, hard knocks, and all of that, uh, the music business the hard way, whereas the young folks today who are in the music business have really learned from your experiences. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. Don't you think? I hope so. You know, I, I mean, uh, I think I'm very encouraged by, uh, by music and the creation of music uh, that's, that's still happening in the different... I know a lot of guys, my, and, uh, you know, veterans and guys like myself who've been around for, for 40, 30, 40 years, you know, we, we tend to, to uh, be, I don't, I don't want to say dismissive of the music today, but uh, I, don't, I don't like doing that because there's so much creativity going on. Of course, there's always been music that sucked, you know what I mean, that wasn't good, you know, and, uh, but, uh, I think there's always music right now as far as as far as radio and stuff. I, there's a lot of stuff people aren't hearing because of the radio situation. So I think if they search out and go out and thank God that there's there are more uh, avenues for people to search for music and to get it through the internet and and uh, you know other means that don't just settle for what's going on what you're hearing. Go out, go you know, go around the world. And, and get great music, you know, that's basically what it is. And, and that's, that's where I, I'm, I'm very encouraged by what I'm hearing because that's what I do, man. I, I, I don't, sometimes I listen to the radio, but then a lot of times I just get on the internet or get on, you know, one of my, one of my uh, uh, avenues to search for music and, and find some great stuff, you know. Well, there's a lot of good music out there, and uh, and it comes in from different countries and that's right uh, different genres of, of music of all kinds. And you, but then that's one of the things that's been unique about funk music. Also, it, it's been a blend of a lot of different kind of music to to bring us to where we are today. And and maybe at the time we didn't even recognize that we might have been trend centers in a lot of areas of of music. But I'm going to change right. the subject for a moment because I, while I was waiting to talk to you, something came up that was very interesting and I want to have you elaborate on that. And that's about your wife dancing with, um, she was a dancer for who? Oh, she was on Soul Train. She was yeah, okay, that, Soul yeah, yeah. Train. Yeah, <laughs> yeah tell, yeah, me, early... tell me that. Tell that story that you told me about meeting your wife and uh, when, <laughs> I guess that's when Cameo appeared on Soul Train. That's right. Okay, uh, tell us that story, because I thought that was so cute. Oh, yeah, people get a kick out of it. Uh, her name is Nisi Payne, and she was one of the uh, main dancers on Soul Train. And actually, she came from Chicago. She's from, from Chicago, and then and, and, uh, people who know know that uh, Don uh, started the show initially in Chicago. And she was 14, 15 years old actually not supposed to be dancing but she started in the studio uh in a little small studio where don had she told me the story that don had uh in chicago and she went and auditioned and and was dancing on the show 
And uh, when Don moved the show to L.A., uh, she came not specifically to be on the show, but just to come out to L.A. And then she came to L.A. and uh, and got on the show the first day she came in to do it. And uh, Don put her like, I guess, on one of the risers that you go on if you wanted like where Louie was. You know, Louie was on one of the risers and Cheryl's song, the girl with the long hair, everybody remembered her, the Asian girl. And her, Louie and Nisi were the probably one of the more the most popular dancers on the show. So we would do the show, of course, we've been on Soul Train numerous times. And uh, when I would go to L.A. and do the show, her and I, you know, we became friends and would hang out. And every time I come to L.A., you know, I'd rent my car. Or, you know, I like to rent Jeeps. Everybody else would be like, let me get a Benz or, you know, BMW, whatever. I got a Jeep, an open top Jeep, because being from New York, you know, in L.A. in this weather, who wants to be all, you know, cooped up in a <laughs> I, I wanted to be in a Jeep. So I'd get the Jeep and I'd say, you drive me. See, you know, so we just have fun going to restaurants and, and clubs and stuff, hanging out. And over time, you know, we we. You know, went our separate ways. You know, I moved out of New York and went to Miami and Atlanta. And, uh, you know, life happened. And about 11 years ago, uh, we, I guess, MySpace was out at the time. And uh, so we found each other again on MySpace and started dating. She, I guess, had just gotten divorced uh, from her husband. And, you know, uh, I was single at the time. And, uh, we got hooked up, went out to eat, and uh, the rest is history. We got married last year. Well, Who knew? <laughs> well, yeah, you know, you always hear these stories about how people were together, then they separate, and then they come back. And you know what? I always look at it like a boomerang. You know, if it's meant to be, it's going to come right on back. And I'm exactly. so happy for you too. You know, and you think about the Don Corneliuses during that time. I mean. He, he was really uh, phenomenal on what he did for uh, funk music and, and giving exposure. You know, nothing like a Dick Clark, uh, but, you know, Don Cornelius was a household name. I mean, that was one of those things that you look forward to. Uh, I did as a young lady uh, going to see how to dance, how to dance, and, and to right. know who the, who the latest groups were that were out. And, uh, and uh, it, it was one of those things that... That's why the uh, Funk Hall of Fame is so important because, right. you know, we have a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland, Ohio, but Funk really uh, covers the nation, but Dayton, Ohio has had had enormous uh, amount of uh, entertainers come out that we would classify under the funk and knowing that Dayton would be a perfect place for us to have the Funk Hall of Fame and having groups like yours, Cameo, and others that are supportive of this initiative, because it's long overdue that we need to recognize what we've done. And the history can only be recorded by us, and we need to do that. All those who are related to the funk era need to work together to make sure that we preserve it. And so I always commend David Webb and his group on pushing forward this initiative for the funk uh, Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center where they are going to have an education component. And I think when, when we think about that, Tommy, all the things that you could teach or tell on the experience of music on what not the do's and the don'ts of the music industry. Um, right. I, I know, as they say, you could write a book about that. Would, would you like to share some of the, uh, the do's and the don'ts of the music industry? Because I think not only when we do these funk chronicles, they should also be educational. I agree. I agree 100%. Uh, uh, I used to think that they had something in the water in Dayton, Ohio. <laughs> there must have been something in the water. Because I am amazed of how many funky groups came out of that city. Uh, Ohio, I mean, just that part of the country is amazing as far as music is concerned. But funk music, you know, Bootsy, come on, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, George, all these people coming out of the uh, out of that. Uh, well, George is from Plainfield, New Jersey, my my hometown, uh, my my home state, but uh, still. You know, Zap, 
uh, uh, Lakeside. I mean, it's it's incredible. Uh, and slave Ohio uh, players, yeah. Slave, oh, oh Ohio players, of course. Slave. And, and even Shirley I mean, Murdoch. We, even Shirley we Murdoch. Tour, oh Shirley, I just yeah. saw Shirley one day. We did a show up in uh Cal up in Northern California, and I hadn't seen Shirley in so long, and it was such a blessing to see her. I just get such a great feeling when I see Shirley, man. She's just an amazing individual. And um, all of these, not only an uh, uh, awesome singer, but she's just a beautiful person. But uh, uh, funk music, it was, this is why the, 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 hunk, the Funk Hall of Fame and e Exhibition Center is so important because you mentioned the do's and don'ts. I think that uh, when you look at what the what the musicians came from, the early musicians, who 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 the forebearers of our music. I mean, I can remember, you know, watching James and and uh, James, uh, James Brown. Brown, you know, yeah. at the Apollo. You know, I can remember uh, the sound and what it was so different that uh, this is this was something that was new that was fresh that had to make that was making an impact and people probably didn't even know how it why it was affecting them so much but the beat the way the the the, the one on the one you know the way that is you know and George picked up on that you know and we learned from George our first tour was with George Clinton and Parliament Funkadelic and the Barcase in 1977 you know and we went out for a year. I mean, it was an incredible, incredible experience, and uh, and the f funk music has to be recognized for the groundbreaking and for the 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 uh, the way that it is still influencing music. I just heard. I was on Periscope the other day, and I just heard George Clinton and uh, George Clinton, Ice Cube, and. Uh, one other artist, uh, dang, I forgot, uh, and I love him too. I can't remember his name right now, but uh, I will in a second. Have a new song out, and it's funky, but that's what's going on. It's all hip hop and funk have always met, been a, a great match, but but now you see that George Clinton, who is almost 80 years old, is still doing it, looking good, you know. Out of, out of the the situations that he's always been plagued with from the past, he's healthy. He's he's looking good. He's feeling good, sounding good, and you know those types of of, uh, of experiences are great. So one thing you can learn that we that we've learned and that the young folks now can learn is don't fall into the trap of being the same or doing things because it's it's. Uh, uh, easy or you hear it on the radio and because labels nowadays uh, what there are left of them uh, and, and producers everybody's got this sound that they want you to have in order to be popular and commercial I've always said and, and Cameo has always been a, promo a, promo a promoter of creativity uniqueness and being you who you are as a musician as an artist as a person because that's how you're going to get that's you it may not be evident because a lot of the people were before their time and now they're finally becoming recognized in terms of the the you know the uniqueness and the and the dynamic uh music or art or whatever they had back then now they're just being recognized because they were ahead of their time so be you be unique because that's what's going to, sooner or later, that's going to separate you from everybody else. And that's what people, that's what you want. You want something that you haven't heard before, you know. And, and what else would you, what else would you add to that? One is uniqueness. You, we should at least have three gems here. One is uniqueness. Number two is what? Be, be smart. Write your music. Write, write, write your own music if you can. Because uh, when I became a songwriter, and it was almost, I've always written. I've written a, I've, I've written a novel. Um, I'm writing my second one now. Uh, but I've always been a writer. And 
when I started writing songs, uh, and it wasn't apparent at the time, but when about 10 years later I started getting the checks, I was like, this is okay, because that's something for your future. You know, I mean, you could become a huge star. I mean, I don't think uh, Whitney Houston wrote a song. You know, uh, she did maybe, you know, she wasn't a big songwriter like maybe uh, uh, a lot of other artists are who write their own music. Uh, but she still was a huge, huge superstar, you know. But I, I like to say that if, you're, if you can write, uh, that goes a long way towards... Uh, establishing your own identity and your own voice and that makes a big difference writing writing music that's that's one good thing staying away from drugs man you know stay away from the stay away from that now, you know I know you know cocaine and all that stuff is is you know popular in music and you know weed is you know always been popular but you know stay get, get don't fall into that trap of of, of drugs and you know alcohol and all of that man that's that's crazy that's that's just crazy that you may think it that it uh may enhance your your you your creative your creativity but it, you know in the end it really doesn't we've all been through it you know we've all been through it and uh i'm so happy that's and experience to say. speaking that's experience speaking oh yeah i'm happy to say i'm still sitting there in front of you in this daggone computer talking you know what I mean? Because yeah. it's, well, it's, it's a blessing, you know, well, but, you know, that's, that's one of the things, you know. Well, Tommy, you, you, what you said is that if I was going to take the three gems that you've just given us, one is that um, to be different, don't be afraid to be yourself, be an individual. Number two, write your music, uh, make sure you copyright it so you can have some royalties on it. And number right. three is uh, stay away from those things that will take away your gifts that you have been so blessed with. That is drugs, alcohol, and any other deviant behavior that would uh, sacrifice all the things that you've worked toward. Now, at this point in time, I understand you're writing a book, you've written a book, but I also understand that uh, you are talking about a uh, funk film and, yes. and um, I need you to show us your funk shirt that you're wearing right now as you tell me real about your, hey there, I always love this scene here because this is the headless man with the funk music hall of fame and exhibition shirt. Thank you so much. So in your last comment Damn. here, you got about eight seconds. Tell me. Oh, I got eight seconds. Oh, yeah. um, the funk music. The the, uh, the the funk music is called. The, the music is called. Uh, I mean, the movie is called Osmosis. It's a story about funk. David knows about it. My partner Nate Williams is is the writer, and it's going to be amazing. And you're going to be hearing a lot about it in the future. Thank you. Tommy Jenkins of Cameo for sharing this interview with me on the Funk Chronicles. Folks, s support the Funk Chronicles. Support the idea of the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center. This is something we can all take pride in and have a wonderful week. See you next time.